if I can relate with God being your father as a young 18-year-old, I had dropped out of high school at 16, was a long-haired surfer. My dad had left the scene when I was 13, and this whole idea of God being a father and leading and guiding and having a plan and a purpose for your life is extremely real to me because he became what I never had, a father. And he led and guided my life, and I've, I've tried the best I can to be obedient to him and to follow his lead. And tonight we're going to talk a little tonight. I felt like it was tonight by the time I got up here. I'm thinking, okay, it's tonight. Uh, we are going to take some time today and look at, go all the way back to the book of Genesis. We're not doing a psalm today and look at not our biological father, Adam, but our spiritual father, Abraham, father of faith. So if you have a Bible, uh, go to Genesis chapter 12, Genesis chapter 12, and we'll look at Abraham, father of faith, a husband, a leader, a father, a follower of the Lord. So let's pray together. Maybe turn this mic down just a little. It's got a little bit of screechy sound to it. Lord, thank you so much for the privilege of gathering together in your name. Thank you for being a faithful father. Thank you for leading and guiding and healing and restoring and disciplining and caring for each of us in an amazing way that you do. Help us, Lord, to be obedient and submitted to your voice, your word, and to bring honor to your name. We ask and pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, many times when you come into church... You can get the idea that all the couples and all the families all around you are like problem free. Everything is wonderful and blissful in their homes, no real issues, no drama. You think, well, that couple looks like, well, you know, they're, they're sort of a model family. All the husbands are enjoying loving intimacy and support of their wives. All the wives are feeling totally understood and deeply appreciated by their husbands. Every night they have long, meaningful conversations. And the kids, well, they're, they're loving and respecting their parents, seeking their counsel and wisdom. Uh, they, they want to grow and follow their parents' godly example. Well, there, there's no such thing as a perfect problem free family. They don't exist. I mean, I looked really hard for one, and I, I did find one that I think meets the bill. Because they're not real. And there's no such thing as a perfect, problem-free family, right? Right? If someone, in fact, were to take the Bible and say, let's look for a godly model family, and let's write a story about them. Who would that family be? Would it be Jacob? I mean, he had 12 sons filled with jealousy and envy and hatred. I mean, talk about a dysfunctional family. Read about Jacob's family. What about Noah? That, that, we can't even talk about Noah because it's beyond PG-13. We can't go there in this message. How about Moses? Great man, great abilities, authority, but all the trouble he had with his brother and his sister. You ever have trouble with your siblings? Moses did. David, the greatest king of Israel, but he had a son named Absalom who hated his father. Hey, mom, dad, you, you ever have a, a son or a daughter who said to you they hate you? Well, you're in good company. When the greatest kings of Israel had a child that hated him. I mean, the Bible steps into 
some really wild and crazy family lives. And in Genesis chapter 12, we take a look at the father of faith, father of God's people. He's known as Father Abraham. He's known as the father of faith. But also, all of us, all men and women, are in process. No one has reached the lofty position of perfection or the perfect family, the person sitting next to you or around you is a total sinner under construction. I mean, don't look at them. (laughs) But it's true. God uses ordinary clay pots to carry about his grace and his mercy and his ministry and his message. So here in Acts chapter 12, it says, Now the Lord, verse 1, had said to Abram, Get out of your country from your family. Some of you would say, Why doesn't the Lord speak that to me? (laughs) Get out of your country from your family and from your father's house. To a land that I will show you, I'll make you a great nation, I'll bless you, and I'll make your name great, and you'll be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, I'll curse him who curses you, and in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. And God pronounces this amazing blessing to Abraham. You're going to bless the world. You're going to have amazing life. And he responds. In verse 4, so Abram departed as the Lord had spoken to him. And Lot went with him. And Abraham was 75 years old when he departed from Haran. So here's the thing. Listen. God calls. He speaks. He reveals. And the response is Abraham does it. That's faith. The, the, the act of obedience is the, is the visible demonstration of faith in action. And he's 75 years old. Now, in that time, in, in, in Abraham's life, uh, the lifespan was different, about double than what it is today. Abraham would eventually live to 175 years of age, and his wife Sarah would live to 127 so if you, if you do the math and look at Abraham at this time in his life, he's kind of at midlife. He's halfway through his life. Usually that's when people are kind of putting down deeper roots. They're getting established. They're, they're becoming more stable and getting life organized. And God comes along and he totally uproots Abraham's life. Calls him out. You got to go. And he's willing to go. Abraham, first of all, is a man of faith. He hears, he responds, he obeys, but he's also a man of influence. If you look there at verse 5, then Abram took Sarai, his wife, Lot, his brother's son, all their possessions that they had gathered, and the people whom they acquired in Haran, and they departed to go to the land of Canaan. So they came to the land of of Canaan. He, he, he's a man of influence. His wife, his, his nephew, uh, part of his family, the people who, who were there in Haran, they, they become his, well, they become people who work for him, who he takes care of. They're looking to him for, for future, for resource. So they're willing to follow this man named Abraham who basically tells them, hey, I heard from God. We're going to head out. And so here you have a man who's obedient, a man of faith, a man of influence. But he's also a man, if you'll notice, he's also a man of prayer and worship. In verse 7, the Lord appeared to Abram and said, To your descendants I will give this land. And there he built an altar to the Lord who had appeared to him. In verse 8, and he moved from there to the mountain east of Bethel. And he pitched his tent with Bethel on the west and I on the east. And there he built an altar to the Lord and called on the name 
of the Lord. He builds altars, and he calls on the name of the Lord. He's a man of faith, he's a man of influence, and he's a man of prayer. He's a man of worship. I mean, dad, mom, look at Abraham. Here's a man who who's, who's also has amazing spiritual experiences. You go back to the very beginning. Now the Lord had said to Abraham, it, it seems to me, I, I, I can't verify this in Scripture, but it certainly looks like it, that God audibly spoke to Abraham, gave him a, a clear word and clear direction. In verse 7, then Abraham, the Lord appeared to Abraham. I mean, I don't know what that was. Did he see the glory of God? Did God come in some kind of form? Uh, so this is some, listen, this is some pretty powerful stuff. So, so he builds these altars. He sees the glory of God. He, he hears the voice of God. And, and, and I want you to ha- let me have your attention for a second. Abraham has some powerful spiritual credentials. He's a man of faith. He's obviously a man of influence. He's a man of prayer. And he's had some pretty spectacular spiritual experiences. And so you would think this this would be one amazing dad, one amazing husband, one amazing father. I mean, isn't this what most Christian women want from a man? Lord, give me a husband who hears your word and is willing to obey it, a man of faith. Give me a man who's a leader, who has influence and uses it in a godly way. Give me a man of prayer and worship, one who who hears from God and experiences God in a real and genuine way, someone who walks with the Lord. Is that not the description we have so far of Abraham? But here's the deal. The story continues. And it reveals that even people of great faith are flawed. They're in process. So in this room today, there's lots of flawed fathers. There's lots of flawed families. Because after all that Abraham has experienced, God speaking, God appearing, Abraham obeying, he travels to the promised land. And here in chapter 12, it tells us in verse 6, he passed through the land to the place of Shechem, as far as the terebinth tree of Morah, and the Canaanites were in the land. So, So here's the deal. Listen, he gets to Cana, and the land is full of Canaanites. God, what's the deal? I thought you promised me this land. Now there's all these stinking Canaanites here. How am I supposed to settle here? How am I supposed to, to live here? Huge disappointment. A lot of issues to deal with. And, and he's in that promised land, and, and something goes down there that's very difficult for him. You go down to verse 10. It says, now there was a famine in the land. And Abraham went down to Egypt to dwell there, for the famine was so severe in the land. God, you led me to a place that's full of people that don't want us here. And number two, when we get here, there's a famine. God, I must be in the wrong place because you, you said you were going to bless me. You said your hand would be upon me. And now I can't even find food to eat for all these people I brought with me. And there's people everywhere who don't want us around. You ever been in that situation? Lord, I obeyed. I've taken on responsibility. I told you I'd do what you tell me to do. I prayed. I followed. I sacrificed. I know I heard from you. And Lord, now this? This situation, yeah, Abraham, you're in what's called a test. You're you're in the process of being shaped and molded by by the Lord himself because he didn't make a mistake when he called you. He didn't make a mistake when he told you where to go. So there's a famine in the land. Verse 10, 
And Abraham goes down to Egypt, and he dwells there, for the famine was severe. Now, a lot of people beat up Abraham for going to Egypt. A lot of commentators, theologians. But I say this. There's a famine in the land. They're out of toilet paper. People are going crazy. So he says, we got to go somewhere. i got to feed all these people. i got to take care of my wife. i, I, I got to do something. So he goes to Egypt. And the Bible never criticizes Abraham for going down to Egypt. The problem is, on his way down there, Abraham comes up with a plan. See, in that day, in that culture, in that situation, a single woman would be under the authority and the protection of her father. But if the father had passed, she's under the protection and authority of her brother. So if someone wants to marry a woman, they, they would have to negotiate with the father, and in his absence, with the brother. So this meant if, if you had your eye on an eligible single lady, rule number one, you go to the father, or you go to the brother. Verse 11, chapter 12 of Genesis. And it came to pass when he was close to entering Egypt, that he said to Sarai, his wife, indeed, I know you are a woman of beautiful countenance. You're gorgeous. You're gorgeous. Therefore, it will happen when the Egyptians see you, they will say, this is his wife, and they will kill me. But they'll let you live. Now, he's pretty smart because, first of all, he compliments her like crazy. You're gorgeous, Sarah. You're beautiful. In Hebrew, that means ravishing, gorgeous, pretty, radiant. She was a looker. She's also in midlife, and she's stunning. And so far, Abraham, you're doing pretty good. He's sincere. It's true. He's complimenting his wife. Sarah, dear, I need you to do something for me. See, it's really, you're, you're the problem because you're so good looking. So if they see you, they'll say this is his wife, See, I'm one lucky guy to have you. But in this situation, I'm not so lucky. When the other guys see you, they'll kill me. And so in verse 13, please say you're my sister, that it may be well with me for your sake, and that I may live because of you. We'll only be here for a little while during this famine, Sarah. So let me live. I mean, we can do this, right? We've done this before. He had done it before. If you go to Genesis chapter 20, but don't go there right now. They had done this all along the way. This is a plan that they had worked together, and it worked so far. So as they come near Egypt, he brings up the Sarah, this brother-sister deal we've done before. Let's make it work here in Egypt. So it was, verse 14, when Abram came into Egypt that the Egyptians saw the woman, and she was very beautiful. The princes of Pharaoh also saw her and commended her to Pharaoh, and the woman was taken to Pharaoh's house. So she is beautiful. It's not just his opinion. The Egyptians thought so as well. Now listen, if you're the king of Egypt, you're the Pharaoh, you don't have to go online dating. You don't have to do any of that. You actually got, you've actually got people out there looking for women for you as they come into town. Some of you guys would love that. They check her out. He's got scouts looking for women that are suitable for him. So they tell Pharaoh, hey, there's a new lady in town. She's gorgeous. She's not married. So Pharaoh sends gifts to the brother. He treated Abraham well for her sake. 
He had sheep and oxen and male donkeys, male and female servants, female donkeys. And then in verse 16, it also says camels. I, I looked into a little bit of the culture and the history, and at this time, during this era, a camel was a brand new kind of mode of transportation that just coming on the scene. And he sent him, be like today, someone sending you a Ferrari or a Tesla. He's got a camel. This is, this is good stuff. And, he, and he's caught in the midst of all these gifts and money. Sarah's in the palace. She's powerless. She's vulnerable. And if you're Sarah, you might be thinking, I, I, I married a man of, of faith. I, I married a man of prayer. I married a man of influence and spiritual experience. How in the world did I end up in this situation? Any of you ladies ever think that? There she is. Abraham has his flaws, his weaknesses, his faults. And every wife and every father and every husband, every man does. There's no perfect families. No perfect husbands, no perfect fathers. There seems to be no way out. And I love verse 17 because it begins this way, but the Lord. And that's an awesome way to start that first, but the Lord. And then all of a sudden, the, the hope thermometer gets high. He said, but the Lord plagued Pharaoh and his house with great plagues because of Sarah, Abram's wife. And Pharaoh called Abram and said, what is this you've done to me? Why did you not tell me that she was your wife? This is a, a powerful intervention by God who steps in where Abraham could not to save the marriage, to save the family. Without God stepping in, it was over. I believe God protected Sarah and Abraham from their own deception. Now, now, I want you to listen. I want you to pay attention. This situation right here in verse 17, it's called God's amazing grace. God steps in where no one else could possibly step in. And I'm pretty sure it was probably a very awkward, difficult trip home. Sarah's going, hey, I'm tired of this brother-sister game. Almost didn't work this time. Now, 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 please tune in. You might say, John, wait, Sarah was part of it. She agreed to it. Yeah. A Cu couple of things I'd point out right, right here is in every marriage, you have two sinners, not just one. And all of us are in this process of following the Lord. If you're a wife, if you're, if you're married, You're married to a person who's in process, a dad, a husband, and they're being transformed, hopefully, by Christ. Dad, husband, mom, wife, here's what I found out. All of them disappoint one another at one time or another. I won't ask you to raise your hand when's the last time. But we all do. We, we don't meet each other's expectations. And listen, maybe you know this, when your kids will blow it. The kids will not always meet your expectations. And we also need miracles of God's grace. This is the point of the story part of it, that God steps in to a flawed family in a difficult situation and does something with his grace. Here's, here's the big, probably headline that could be over this passage. He is able to deliver. Amen? He can do it. There is a living God. They had no other option but to look to the Lord. Sarah knew God had promised to bless them. See, this is an interesting thought. Sarah knew the promise that God had given to Abraham and that it was not just for Abraham because she was going to be a part of it too because he said, I'll bless your seed. 
The Messiah would come through both Abraham and Sarah. Don't underestimate what God can do with your faithfulness. So she stepped into the plan. Now, if you're Abraham, a husband, a dad, what's the application here for you, for me? Well, I think number one would be stop the deception. Stop those things that you know are not true, are not right. See, it's so easy to drift through life with secret sins. Abraham is an example of someone who, who, who was trying to deceive to save a certain situation, and it backfired on him. Hiding. Convincing yourself, well, I, I've got away with this so far, which certainly was the case with Abraham and Sarah. This has worked out for me so far. Nothing ha- will happen. No one will find out. It'll be okay. But here's the deal. The Scripture says this. Be sure your sins will find you out. See, I would say to dad, to husband, if you're here today and you have some kind of deception going on in your life, the the pills that you have hidden somewhere in the closet or the bottle or whatever it is that you're trafficking in that you know is deception to your family, to your wife, to whoever it might be, this is a passage of Scripture that would say, stop. Don't. There are wages that have to be paid, the Bible says, for sin. That you'll be found out. And, and, and part of the message here, part of the application, I think, would be this. If you're hiding it, turn from it. Today would be a great day. You would say, hey, in Father's Day 2021, I quit deceiving myself and others around me with this habit or situation in my life. Let it end. Be finished. Let that be God's voice to you. That you know what? No more living that lie. It's a great application from the life of Abraham. And number two, I think one of the things that we can learn from Abraham here as a dad, as a father, as a husband. Well, look at verse 12. Genesis chapter 12. Therefore, it will happen when the Egyptians see you, Sarah, they will say, this is his wife, and they will kill me. But they'll let you live. Not only deal with the deception, but stop making everything about you. That's what he does. She's beautiful, but, but me. They'll kill me. No, nowhere does it ever imply that they would kill him. This is in his own mind, in his own heart. Stop making everything about you. Let it be about your wife, about your family, about your job as a husband. How much could be avoided if you stop focusing on me? Me, me. Poor me. I know, but, but me. I, I got to have my hobby. I gotta, it, it, it's me, it's me, it's me. But, yeah, but, but you, but, but it's me. Me. One of the things that, that kind of comes off the page here to me at least is number one, you know, stop the deception. And number two, quit being so self centered. And that's all Abraham could see. He sets his wife up, oh, you're gorgeous, you're beautiful, but, but what about me? And I think there's a word here for guys that don't make it all about me. And number three, Face your fear with faith. Basically, he did this whole thing because he was afraid. We don't, we don't know if anyone would have actually killed Abraham. That's all in his mind. But it was all based on fear. And a lot of men have a lot of fear of being known for who we really are. Of, of being seen as we really are. Not measuring up. What would happen if they, they knew what I was really like? Fear of the future. F- face your fears 
with the Lord. You say, well, John, how do you do that? Well, I, I think one great way to start would be just tell the Lord what you're afraid of. Tell the Lord, Lord, I'm, a, I'm afraid of, of this at my job or in my home or in my future or, or in my neighborhood or in my workplace. Or I, this, is, this is what I'm afraid of. Just let the Lord know. You, you might do something with simple extra. You might take a piece of paper and write down, this is what I fear. This is it. Don't let your wife see it. But let the Lord see it. And at the end of that, that little list, write, Lord, help me. Help me. This is what I fear because of deception in my life. This is what I fear because it's all about me. This is what, what I fear. And finally, I would say this. Don't give up on what God's called you to be and do with your life as a husband, as a father. Abraham didn't. Sarah didn't. Do it for the sake and the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. That's why you do it. See, here's this, this simple little story about a, a man who gets a call. He has all these spiritual experiences. He's, he's, he's faithful. He's, he's a guy who's prayerful. He's a guy who's in, influential. He's a guy who's, you know, had amazing spiritual experience, but he's also extremely flawed. And you, and you find out that he's, you know, got this whole situation of fear. He's got this situation of being focused on himself, and he, he, he deals with life with deception, and yet God, in his amazing grace, steps in and does what Abraham never could do. And God is faithful. He's a faithful father. We're, we're all flawed. But I love the fact that in the midst of Abraham, whom we know as, and, and he is, not just in Christianity, the father of faith. And God takes this flawed individual, brings tests into his life to refine him and shape him and mold him and change him. He doesn't give up on him, and Abraham never gives up on the Lord. See, be a father of faith. Let your kids see that. Wow. Dad stepped out and did something that the Lord told him to do. The, the, the influence it could have just on your family could be amazing. Be, 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 a, be a father of, of, of influence. You might be surprised. Simple little acts that you would do that point others to the Lord. Stories you can tell. Well, all I did was do this, but... To that person, it was giant. Be, be, a, be a, a father who has spiritual experiences. Let the Lord speak and ask him to show up and, and remember that it's not all about you. It's about him. I love this simple chapter in Genesis chapter 12. He doesn't even talk about his kids yet. But you, you see this man who, who God has spoken to, has appeared to, and even though he's extremely flawed, God demonstrates his grace and he deals with his character and his life in a way that's very, very powerful. I think Abraham expected to show up in Canaan and it was just going to be all set up. And sometimes we think that. Well, if I'm following the Lord, everything's just going to fall into place. It's just going to be perfect. Certainly there won't be a pandemic. No flooding. Everything will be a breeze because God said, follow me. But then we learn when Jesus comes along, he says, oh, yeah, and also take up your cross. So Abraham learns this lesson. He's learning it all through his journey. But my, my message today is basically about recognizing that we're all flawed. We're all in process, and God can and will step in. Trust him, but do away with the deception. Do away with the big me and face your fears with the Lord because 
the Lord is more than able to deal with every situation and fear in your life and in my life. Happy Father's Day.